When you think of the world's most dangerous bird, as I do sometimes, eagles or vultures may come to your mind. Surprisingly, these awkward cassowaries may cause way more damage than the other, more notorious angry birds I first mentioned. The largest cassowary species may be as tall as an average person and weighing as much. These plump birds can't fly, but neither can you. Plus, they run fast, so don't you try to escape from them. They can reach you even in water since they're great swimmers. They can run as fast as 30 miles per hour, so you might need a getaway car if there's a cassowary who's mad at you. But don't worry, their attacks are quite rare anyways. Mute swans are gorgeous, graceful creatures. At least that's what we all think. But touching one of these 28-pound birds is a bad idea. They have bony spurs in their wings that they use to take enemies out. Their wingspan is about 8 feet, and they can slap you with all of that. And they also bite. Don't ever get too close to one. They regularly go after humans, especially if the bird has younglings nearby. And don't let the name fool you either. They aren't mute. Swans can hiss loudly and even bark. Good warning signs that you're encroaching a bit too close. Humans and magpies have always had weird, almost love-hate relationships. These medium-sized birdies can be pretty aggressive at times, but if you treat them well, you'll probably become friends. They can recognize human faces, and they're sure to come back to your balcony if you treat them to something yummy. If you offend a magpie, they're gonna remember that too and bear some grudges. So keep an eye on your eye, pardon the pun. Pelicans are symbols of love, and they say they're ready to sacrifice their own life to protect their offspring. Ah, now it's clear why they can swallow the entire prey without even chewing it or tearing it. You just don't want to go near their nest. Sure, you're not a tiny fish and pelican beaks are too small for a human being, but you don't want to be bitten now, do you? Okay, this one's going to frighten you only with its name. A shoebill stork is an impressively large bird, up to 5 feet, just below the average human height. No wonder they can fight a crocodile. Alright, a baby crocodile. But they need only their super powerful jaw to win in one hit. Still not afraid? Well, they make blood chilling noises, as if you were in some action blockbuster movie. Hmm. If you think these cowardly ostriches don't pose any danger, You got it wrong. Twice! First, they actually don't shove their heads in the sand. It's an optical illusion. And yeah, how are they even supposed to breathe in the sand? Second, these guys are kind of overprotective parents. So if you ever want to approach their young, these heavyweight beasts who can run as fast as a car within city limits are gonna come for you. Not scared yet? Well, you should be. Ostriches are the closest living relatives to T-Rex together with chickens. What seems look quite harmless, except for their foul smell, but that's another story. But their babies have notorious wings. The chick's flappers have two distinct claws that are multi-purpose. First, they are a sort of protection against predators. And second, they help them climb trees in case the baby's out of the nest. Once they grow up, the claws disappear just like milk teeth. Size doesn't matter at times. If you were a hummingbird, you'd have to eat almost 300 pounds of food per day to maintain normal weight with that little bird's metabolism. But the lifespan would be way shorter too, only about 3 to 5 years. If you dye your hair, you probably have more in common with a bearded vulture than you might think. We're probably the only two species in the world who use dye on purpose. Vultures dye their feathers with red soil to show their dominance over other birds. People? Well, we just like changes. California condors may not be as large as an aircraft, but they're huge anyways. Their wingspan is almost 10 feet. These are potentially dangerous for people, but chances that you ever meet them are slim. There are only about 200 of them left in the U.S. Here you are, looking for something yummy in the fridge, but you just can't see what you really want. If you were a bastion thrust, 
you'd break wind at the fridge. <laughs> Sounds gross, but that's apparently the way these birdies look for hiding worms. They give them a gas attack, so the worms get shocked and yippee! They are now an easy target for a bashin thrush. Hold your nose and bon appetit! Okay, enough of those funky stories. Let's look at the skies. You wouldn't expect a poisonous bird on this list, but alas, I present to you the hooded pitahui. Scientists found out they were poisonous when they kept experiencing numbness and a burning sensation after handling these birds. There are lots of toxins in their feathers, especially on the underside. The birds don't produce toxins themselves. They probably get them from the beetles they eat. Or how about the spur-winged goose? These guys are notorious for being toxic, too. And the toxicity comes from munching on blister beetles. It's safe to touch them, but eating one can lead to irreversible consequences. Wink, wink. The toxin remains even after cooking. Another bird you don't want to eat is a common quail. Don't mix it up with a Japanese quail, which is usually kept as poultry. Common quails can be really poisonous, leading to even such dreadful consequences as kidney failure. It all depends on the certain plants this bird eats. Good news, it's only poisonous during the migration period, but it's yummy and safe outside the migration. If you're not quite sure, it's better to avoid this one on your plate unless you want some muscle soreness. If you spot a cute, fluffy, snowy owl, you better close your eyes and run. They might look innocent, but in fact, they have razor-sharp talents which they know perfectly how to use. They point them at the most vulnerable parts, like head, eyes, you got it. Do not mess with a snowy owl. One more species you don't want to contact is the little shrike thrush. Say that a few times fast. Shrike thrush. Just look at this tiny birdie and its innocent eyes. And don't let them fool you. Remember the way they look and never touch them. They're as poisonous as notorious Central and South American dart frogs. Blue-capped Ifrida may be tiny, but it has a toxic mechanism that makes this small birdie invincible. They eat only certain types of beetles that provide this bird with special toxins. Even if you touch it, you'll probably get numb as a result of intoxication. It's inedible since the toxins don't disappear even when it's cooked. Golden eagles are the power lifters in the bird's world. They can carry weights up to 4 pounds. They pick up tortoises and other prey easily. These mighty birds are strong enough to steal a toddler, but they actually never do that. Moreover, in Mongolia, people even use these eagles to hunt wolves. Canada geese have been living close to humans for years, but they're still wary of us getting near their homes, especially in the spring mating season. At this time, the geese can chase and bite people they consider a threat to their eggs, mates, or babies. If you want to avoid being attacked by these seriously angry birds, the best thing you can do is just slowly back away. Romantic seagulls in the sky don't seem to cause many problems. The worst thing they can do is leave you some unwanted droppings. Well, this impression is pretty misleading because these birds are very aggressive. Like all of their kind, they don't attack because they feel like doing so. So the rule is quite simple. Just don't touch those birds and stay away from their nests. Oh, and when the time machine is finally invented, be especially careful with the birds from the past. Velociraptors are long past existing, just like the rest of the dinosaurs. They had talons and feathers, so these guys were actual birds and not scaly lizards. By the way, these are the stiletto sharp talons you should be afraid of. These could cut anything. Beware if you go into the future, too. You never know what's waiting for you over there. To make any matches waterproof, cover them with a thin layer of transparent nail polish and let them dry well. To always have something to light them with, glue a piece of fine sandpaper to a lid of a plastic box and put matches inside. Cotton clothing won't keep you safe and warm out in the wild. It takes forever to dry from sweat or rain, and wet clothes lose heat 25 times faster than dry ones. If you don't want to freeze, Go for polyester, nylon, or wool. Take microfiber towels that dry in an hour. 
If you're lost in a forested area, try to find a spot with dark or damp soil. It's likely there's water under it, and you can make a seep well for fresh drinking water there. Dig a hole about twice as wide as your arm from elbow to fingertip and half as deep. Use small rocks to line the side and the bottom to keep the dirt from your fresh water source. You can use your t-shirt or a bandana as a water filter. Put one end of it in a container filled with dirty water standing above an empty container for clean water. The other end goes in there, and the water pours in, cleansing itself on the way. Be sure to boil the filtered water before you drink it. Another use for your t-shirt is a dew collector. Wipe it over some grass covered with dew early in the morning, then squeeze it into a container and you'll have safe drinking water. You can also leave it in a rainstorm to collect some water. A clean shirt or fabric works best. To survive a waterfall plunge, take a deep breath as you are getting close to the edge. Reposition your body to go down feet first. Wrap your arms around your head and seal your nose from water with your elbows. Tense your muscles, put your legs together, and close your mouth and eyes as tight as you can. When you get to the bottom, start swimming away from the waterfall while you're still underwater. Now, if you ever fall into rapids, hold onto a boulder, a log, or whatever comes handy so that the water doesn't carry you deeper. Throw off any heavy gear and start swimming downstream in the direction of the shore. Don't stand up and walk even if the water seems shallow, because the currents can carry you back. To come out of a storm dry and warm, you can make yourself a waterproof trash bag mini shelter. Just make a hole for your face and put it on. Use two bags to keep your feet dry, too. You can also build an A-frame shelter out of a trash bag. Find some cordage for the central rib. Split the bag into a blanket and cover the rib with it. Use four rocks to keep the corners down. If you hear thunder outside, count the seconds between it and the lightning flash. If it's less than 30 seconds, you've got to hide somewhere because the storm is too close. If you can't do that, at least stay away from tall, lone trees. If you're in a group, spread out to minimize the risks of everyone getting struck. To help your campfire keep you warm for longer, put some rocks around it. They'll keep the heat and spread it even when the fire is gone. You can also boil water with them if you drop a hot rock in a metal container with water. To escape quicksand, shift your weight to your right leg and shake your left foot to get it up to the surface. Get your left knee on top of the sand and shake your right foot to get it out into a kneeling position as well. When you're on solid ground again, carefully roll as far away from the quicksand as you can. If you find yourself trapped inside a cave, you have to stay calm and not use matches to light up your way. It can take some priceless oxygen from you. Protect yourself from breathing in dust with a t-shirt or whatever you're wearing. Just wrap it around your head. Make a whistle out of an acorn cap to call for help. Hold the cap with both hands between your thumb and index finger. Make a V with your thumbs near the top of the acorn. Hold it close to your mouth and let some air in that triangle in the cap. You gotta practice a bit to make a loud sound. To stay warm in the wild, use grass or leaves. Get them under your clothes or blankets for an extra layer of insulation. This tip works both for winter and summertime. You always risk losing more body heat than you can produce. To set a tree on fire even when it isn't dry, use the Swedish fire log technique. Set the log vertically. Make a star-shaped incision as deep as possible. Put some splinters and dry grass inside the log and set it on fire. It should start burning quickly and last from 2 to 5 hours, no matter what size or type of wood you use. As you prepare to spend a night in the wild, find a big rock that can fit your sock or pillowcase. Put it close to your campfire to absorb some heat, but don't let it get burning hot. Turn it around so that it warms up on each side. Once it's ready, carefully wrap it in your cloth with two layers for better insulation and put it into your sleeping bag. In case you go kayaking and your vessel flips upside down, don't try to turn it over from underwater. Instead, get yourself out of it and swim deeper down and away from the kayak, and only then get out of the water. If you're nearsighted and lose your glasses or contacts in the wild, curl your index finger into a tiny hole and look through it. 
A pinhole works like a natural lens that lets the light through in one place and keeps things in focus. In case you're lost in the wild and want to escape as soon as possible, stop your attempts for the night. Hungry, nocturnal animals will just love to meet you out there. Plus, there can be insects and snakes on the ground that you'll never spot in the dark. If you don't have a sleeping bag, you better sleep above the ground. Don't climb on trees, you might easily fall from it at night. Instead, take any large piece of fabric, make knots on both ends, then tie a rope on each side and secure it between two trees. If you don't have a rope on you, why not? Nah, you can make one yourself out of plants. Just find some long grass, better dry one, and weave it together in a braid or just a cord. After a rendezvous with bugs and mosquitoes, put some toothpaste on the affected areas on your skin. Menthol will cool down those spots and reduce all the unpleasant sensations. A banana peel, some ice, or aloe vera will also work. To relieve a bad headache without a pill, chew on willow bark. It works just like aspirin. It shouldn't have any side effects unless you're allergic to aspirin or take too much of it. If you get lost, remember the rule of three to stay calm and do the right things in the right order. You can survive three minutes without air, three hours in extreme temperature, three days without water, and three weeks without food. So start with building shelter, then get water, and only then take care of food. You can clear your car windows of mist with a raw potato. Rub a half of it on the inside of your windshield to spread the starch evenly across the glass. When it dries up, it'll stay on the glass, and it won't get misty again. You can see clearly now, the rain, I mean, the fog is gone. You wake up in the middle of the night from the feeling as if someone's peering at you from the darkness. You open your eyes and see... Oh, hi, Biscuit. It's your pet hamster that you took in just yesterday. It's sitting right before you. And there's something primal about it. Suddenly, the hamster stands up on his hind legs and howls like a wolf, only much higher, like a whistle. Then, Biscuit scampers to the window, takes one last look at you, and jumps out into the street. What in the world was that? Calm down. It's just that what you took for a hamster was really a werewolf mouse. Or simply, grasshopper mouse. It's a perfect hunter. It's agile, quick, and doesn't feel pain. The mouse lives in North America and doesn't like digging holes. Why work if you can drive the owners out of their homes? This cute ball of fuzz preys on grasshoppers, snakes, and spiders. But most of all, it loves dangerous prey. Arizona bark scorpions are extremely venomous, but our cutie here, he doesn't care. Over millions of years of evolution, the rodent learned to process scorpion neurotoxins into an energy drink. The venom is, for this mouse, like 100 cups of coffee for you. Plus, it helps you not feel pain. The more venom in the mouse's body, the more it looks like a viking gone berserk. After the battle, the rodent raises its head into the night sky and howls. The sound is more like a whistle, but loud. If the animal howled in the center of a soccer field, you'd hear it from the stands. This way, the mouse makes itself known and tells everyone, I'm in charge here, so don't you dare cross me. You don't believe? (laughs) Ask the poor scorpion. So when you woke up in your room, your mouse was singing a victory song. It may have just chased away a poisonous insect that had infiltrated your room. Nature took pity on humanity and made the grasshopper mouse small. But if you see one close by, then get out of there quickly. It means the werewolf mouse is hunting and there's a scorpion somewhere near. Mouse cubs, even in captivity, remain aggressive. They're like the Spartan children of antiquity. From the first days of life, they're ready to fight. Imagine that you got a job in a company creating our planet. You come to the office and your boss says, Newbie, I need a project on a new animal on my desk tonight. Beside yourself, you tried a bit too hard. And the result? 
was the platypus. The animal is covered with soft fur. It's got a tail like a beaver's, flippers, and a duck's bill. The platypus lays eggs, but it feeds its young with milk. <laughs> You've got a crazy imagination. Male platypuses have venomous spurs on their hind legs. The venom isn't dangerous to humans, but you still better avoid petting the animal. If it stings you with those spurs, then a week of severe pain is guaranteed. What animal has the nastiest temperament on the planet? That's easy, a honey badger. Most of all, it resembles a skunk that visits the wrestling gym five times a week. And it smells like that too. The honey badger weighs as much as a two-year-old child, but it's not afraid of anyone. It doesn't care who's confronting it, be it a venomous snake, two lions, or a pack of hyenas. It'll attack them and win. You want honey? No problem. Befriend a badger and it'll demolish a beehive for you. It's not afraid of stings. The honey badger has thick skin that's difficult to break through and also sharp claws and strong jaws. The honey badger scares everyone in Africa, but it's got cousins in North America and Eurasia. Those guys have a bad temper too. Although it's difficult to call it a giant, wolverines will not hesitate to attack a bear or an elk. The animal grows no larger than a medium-sized dog. If you offended it, then I don't envy you. It's hardy, knows how to swim, and is a fast runner. Wide paws are like snowshoes and don't allow it to fall into the snow. You can't hide from a wolverine on a tree either. It climbs with uncanny agility. The wombat is a cute animal that resembles a fluffy bear. It's stocky and weighs as much as a German shepherd. The wombat lives in Australia where it digs deep holes and has the most original protection in the world. If the enemy tries to get into its underground house, the wombat blocks the entrance with its, um, backside. This part of the body consists of four fused bones. For a wombat, it's sort of a shield, and it's difficult for a predator to bite through it. The animal is peaceful, but it has poor eyesight, and, well, it isn't very smart. If it thinks you're posing a threat, it will attack. The Indian Grey Mongoose is a real champion when it comes to fighting cobras. During the fight, it's beautiful and dances so fast that the snake doesn't have time to react to tricks. The cobra gets tired and decides to run away as soon as possible. The animal is protected from cobra fangs by its thick fur and immunity to cobra venom. Mongooses are relatives of cats and are popular pets in India. The animals love to sit on their owner's lap, but retain a wild character. In nature, mongooses rarely attack people, but if cornered, they become unpredictable. Nobody knows how many rats there are on the planet exactly, but at least twice as many as us humans. These are amazing animals that can laugh, dream, and feel stress. They live in packs and can hunt prey dozens of times larger than themselves. Scientists have found rat bite marks on the ribs of dinosaurs that are 75 million years old. They also have kings. They don't wear crowns though. It's the name for several rats whose tails are tied in a knot. The largest king ever recorded consisted of 32 animals. Possums have been around since the days of the dinosaurs. Their acting skills help them survive to this day. As soon as danger appears nearby, this hero rarely rushes into the fray, but it doesn't run away either. It falls to the ground and starts, well, playing possum. It doesn't move at all and even slows down its breath and heartbeat. I'm sure this animal deserves an Oscar. For realism, this actor releases a scent. It's so bad that predators would rather stay hungry than approach a possum. The animal has no control over its acting ability. It's a natural response to stress. Possums aren't aggressive, but if cornered, they growl. Their fur stands on end and they show their teeth. Small, but razor sharp. You won't call the Selenodon a nice guy. 
You can recognize it by red hair, a Pinocchio nose, and a hairless long tail. It's got sharp teeth, and special glands in its mouth make its saliva toxic. Surprisingly, the animal has no immunity against its own venom. That's why it's really careful while grooming. Solenodons are aggressive by nature. If it gets bored, it gets angry, grunts like a pig, and can lunge at anyone in the vicinity. Luckily, its toxic saliva isn't harmful to humans. The pygmy gerboa is the smallest rodent on Earth. It looks like a baby kangaroo and weighs a little more than a penny. The largest is the capybara, and it's difficult to look at without a smile. But this isn't the limit. Millions of years ago, a rodent the size of an African buffalo lived on the planet. Phoberomys ate plants and resembled both a hippo and an overgrown guinea pig at the same time. Now, the next animal would easily win the first prize for the most unusual rodent on the planet. This monster is a naked mole rat. And yes, it's naked and lives underground. Its appearance is too much, even for a rodent. Most of all, the mole rat looks like a sausage from a horror movie. But that's not the point. On average, a rodent of this size lives for two to three years. Naked mole rats live in the wild for 30 years. Imagine if people could live to be a thousand years old. For a rodent, 30 is pretty much the same. Scientists believe that perhaps this unsightly digger will help humanity solve the problem of aging. One family can have up to 300 naked mole rats. In the concrete hard African soil, they dig cities the size of six football fields. People don't meet these rats. They rarely come to the surface and drink no water. These rodents get moisture from plant roots. Well, it's time to stretch your legs and take a walk in the park. The sun is shining, and you enjoy the weather and life on the hall. That's when you spot a rapidly growing vertical cloud. Bright white at first, it's approaching alarmingly fast, becoming dense and inky. The sky is darkening, and a gust of wind blows the hat off your head. And then, your hair starts to stand on end. That's your cue to run for your life. You're about to be hit by lightning. At this very moment, positive charges are rising through your body. They're reaching toward the negatively charged part of the storm. If you don't react fast, these charges will meet, and it'll end badly for you. If there's nowhere you can hide, crouch down and try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Don't lie flat on the ground. It may be wet and thus a great conductor of electricity. There are also other signs that scream danger during a lightning storm. Your palms may begin to sweat. You might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your skin can start to tingle. There might be a strange metallic taste in your mouth. If you're sure you're not chewing on tinfoil, then look out. Plus, you're likely to smell chlorine. That's ozone. Electrical charges split the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, which are the main gases forming the atmosphere, into separate atoms. When these atoms come together again, some of them produce molecules made up of three oxygen atoms. That's ozone. You can smell it during a thunderstorm because downdrafts bring it from high altitudes to your nose level. You can figure out how close a thunderstorm is by measuring the time between spotting the lightning and hearing the thunder. Every five seconds is one mile. The sky over your head is darkening and turning ominously green. Something hits you on the cheek. Ouch, it hurts. You pick up the offending object. It's a massive hailstone. But it's not that cold outside, and it's not raining. You notice how still everything is, how quiet. There's no wind whatsoever. It makes you think about the calm before the storm. And indeed, soon you hear some noise. It's approaching rapidly and turns into a loud roar, as if a freight train is moving towards you. Only, it's not a train. It's a tornado, and you have almost no time to escape. The funnel isn't visible behind a cloud of debris. But you can't mistake this rotating column of air for anything else. If the tornado catches you on the road, get as far from your car as you can. This will prevent the vehicle from being hurtled toward you. Find a ditch, lie down in it, and cover your head. 
If you're inside, get away from windows and hide underground if possible. Now, you're at the seaside, walking along the shore and enjoying a light breeze. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking under your feet. Must be an earthquake! The next weirdness you notice is the water retreating from the beach at breakneck speed. It leaves behind the exposed ocean floor, reefs, and even fish. That's when you hear a distant roaring sound. It's a tsunami! And you only have a few minutes to save your life. Get to high ground immediately! A giant wave is already speeding toward the shore. It's not the only way a tsunami can creep up on you. It doesn't necessarily come crashing against the shore as a series of huge waves. A tsunami can look like a rapidly rising tide. It usually goes hand-in-hand with severe underwater turbulence. It pulls people under the surface and tosses heavy objects around. You can also notice seawater bubbling, swirling, and creating bizarre patterns. It's another sure sign a tsunami's coming. Your dog's restless. It's scratching the entrance door, roaming around the apartment, and trying to hide in the corner. Usually calm and docile, the pooch is now howling and barking. The weather's also been crazy for the past several days. It's hot one day and chilly 24 hours later. Plus, you've noticed that the stream near your house has livened up, bubbling as it's rushing past. Only when glasses start to clink in your cupboard do you realize what it means. The clatter is produced by foreshocks, tiny earthquakes leading up to the main event. Earthquakes often occur in clusters. If there are several weak quakes, a much bigger one might be on the way. Sometime before the disaster strikes, you might notice bizarre blue lights. Some of them seem to be coming from the ground, others are hovering in the air. These are so-called earthquake lights. Emitted from rocks under great stress, they can be seen days or mere seconds before the ground starts shaking. At the same time, some experts doubt earthquake lights exist. If you think an earthquake is about to happen and there's a catfish in your aquarium, pay attention to its behavior. Scientists have proved this species can react to earth tremors. The fish become restless when seismic activity is high. Some bugs can feel a storm coming. They get ready for the natural disaster by stopping any movement. That's why, if you notice that lots of insects around you look drowsy, search for shelter. As for bees, they can predict heavy rainstorms. They begin to work much harder the day before it starts raining. Square waves occur when two wave patterns crash into each other. This phenomenon looks awesome, but only if you're watching it from the shore. Don't even think of getting in the water to play in such waves. In that place, there are cross currents that can easily pull even a skilled swimmer under the surface. And if you see wild choppy waves carrying ocean debris and seaweed, stay out of the water too. It can be a sign of a strong rip current. It can carry you far away from the ocean. If you see smelly green stuff on the surface of a lake or sea, stay away from the water. It can be a hazardous algal bloom. You won't be able to tell whether it's toxic or not at first sight. That's why it's better to steer clear of it altogether. Three or four days before a hurricane arrives, the sea or ocean surface can swell up to 6 feet. Waves hit the shore every 9 seconds. The closer the hurricane, the more rapidly the waves crash against the shore. They also get higher, sometimes up to 16 feet. The sky is littered with light, fluffy clouds. Roughly 36 hours before the hurricane reaches the shore, the atmospheric pressure begins to drop. After that, the wind speeds up. Wispy, hair-like clouds appear in the sky. 18 hours before the hurricane makes it to the shore, the sky opens up and it starts to pour. The rainwater often floods low-lying areas, welling up to 15 feet. When the hurricane is 12 hours away, a powerful gale starts to bring along loose debris. Six hours before the landfall, the wind speed is already 90 miles per hour. It's strong enough to break and even uproot trees, fling around large debris, and flip cars. By the way, let's say you're sailing and there are some sharks circling your boat. Keep an eye on them. If the predators suddenly leave you alone and head for deep water, it might mean a hurricane is drawing closer. Get back to dry land as fast as you can and warn others. If during a period of heavy rains, you hear a roaring sound, 
it might be a flash flood moving in your direction. If you're near a river at that moment, you might see debris coming down with the flow. The water can be changing its color and becoming cloudier and darker. These signs should set alarm bells ringing in your head. If your gut feeling is right, you have no time to waste. Try to get away from that place as fast as you can. Flash floods are often lethal. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If it's falling or rising rapidly, it might be a sign a landslide is about to happen. And if you see the water turn muddy, don't wait for more evidence. Get out of the area immediately. You're hiking the Point Reyes National Seashore, and you bump into a mountain lion. Stay calm. You need to show it that you're not scared. Shout loudly at the lion. Wave your arms. If that doesn't work, start throwing rocks, branches, or anything else you can get your hands on. Aim at the ground in front of the lion. Never throw anything directly at it. That will only make it angrier. If the lion is getting closer, protect your most vulnerable spots. It will aim for the neck and try to grab your arms. So tilt your head forward and protect your neck. And don't make sweeping arm movements. When the lion realizes that you're not an easy opponent, it will probably back off and run away. You're in Yellowstone. Here you have to come face to face with the grizzly bear. It's drinking water from a creek. A safe distance is 200 feet. The grizzly has spotted you. It stands on its hind legs and looks in your direction. Now it's about the height of an average basketball player and it weighs almost 800 pounds. So you don't stand a chance to win. You have to freeze in place. Grizzlies have poor eyesight, so it just might not see you. But then it starts walking in your direction. Don't turn your back to it and don't even try to run as fast as you can. It will chase you. You need to seem bigger than you really are. Wave your arms and spread your legs a little wider. Always talk and shout at the bear. It will understand that you're not a humble deer. Try to make a clanking sound of metal. If you have food with you, don't throw it at the bear. Just put it on the ground and keep backing away while facing the bear. If it starts running towards you, your only chance is to fall to the ground and freeze. Bears aren't scavengers, so if it thinks you're not alive, it'll just sniff you, shrug, and walk away. Now you go diving on the Florida coast. You have to protect yourself from the great white shark. Never wear shiny and blinging jewelry when swimming. It attracts sharks. And never swim at night. This is when they go out looking for food. Lots of splashing water can also attract this marine predator. But if the shark swims towards you anyway, the rule here is one, do everything in your power to defeat it. Try to stay calm and swim to the shore. If the shark chooses you as food, there's only one thing that can scare it off. Try to punch the shark in the nose, eyes, or gills. Now you're in Africa. Here in the tall grass of the savanna, you see a lion, and worse, it sees you. The first thing you need to do is maintain eye contact. Don't turn your back to the lion and don't run. This eight-foot predator, weighing like three adults, is running at you at the speed of a car on the highway. But then it stops abruptly and continues to stare at you. Lions often make fake charges to frighten their opponent. At this point, you have to appear much bigger than you really are. Spread your arms and make loud noises. Then the lion can make another fake charge. And if you keep standing still, the lion will realize you're a strong opponent and go the other way. The female lion is way more dangerous than the male one. If it's guarding the babies, it won't stop and you won't stand a chance. Your safari jeep takes you to the next location. You see elephants peacefully drinking water. These guys can be 10 feet tall and weigh as much as two SUVs. They can even flip cars over with their powerful tusks. And now, one of them sees you and wags its big ears. It's bluffing. With those ears, the elephant wants to appear bigger and scare you away. It's also scared and won't run at you all the way. You must let the elephant know you're not threatening it. Don't yell or wave your arms. Take slow steps back until you leave the elephant's personal space. If it runs at you with ears to its head, it's not bluffing. Climbing a tree isn't a good option right now. It might ram the tree and you'll fall down. It might even tilt the tree with its strong trunk. You need to run in a zigzag pattern. The elephant is heavy and it's hard for it to change directions quickly. So gradually, you'll start to pull away from it. But still remember that an elephant can run 25 miles per hour. So you'll unlikely escape from it. Now let's move on to the Nile River. It has the largest number of crocodiles in the world. If you are camping, take a distance of at least 160 feet from the shore. This way, the crocodile will not stumble upon your camp at night. Never take your eyes off the crocodile. It can take advantage of that moment and take you by surprise. Their top speed is only 10 miles per hour, but they can make charges at 40 feet per second from the water. So the only chance to survive is to stay out of the water. 
If not, the crocodile's weak points are the eyes, the tip of the nose, and the membrane in the throat. This membrane prevents water from entering the crocodile's throat. When running away from a crocodile, be careful not to bump into a hippopotamus. This is one of the most dangerous animals in the world. They can be the size of a business class car and weigh as much as a big elephant. And they can run as fast as horses, so they're sure to outrun you in a sprint. The main thing is to not frighten it. If you're standing far away, get its attention with a loud sound. Usually they will try to get away from you. Use this moment to back away too. But if you see a hippo yawning, it's a sign that you're violating its comfort zone. They can open their mouth at 180 degrees and have the bite force of a crocodile. So you can't beat it and have to run. The best option is to climb a tree or some kind of slope. Hippos have a hard time climbing high places. And if you manage to escape, you'd be one of the few people who survived a face-to-face -face encounter with a hippo. There's also buffaloes living here in the savannah. They can be as tall as an adult and weigh a whole ton. And unlike lions and elephants, they don't make a fake charge. If you see this machine running at you, it definitely has evil intentions. Their powerful horns and skull can bend sheets of metal. They can turn a new car into a pile of scrap metal. You can never outrun a buffalo, so your only option is to find the nearest tree and run to it before the buffalo even starts its charge. If you run into a snake, you need to freeze in place. There are endless species of snake, and you don't know if your opponent is venomous or not. So you definitely need to avoid getting bitten. Make smooth and slow backward movements. If the snake is following you, stop and start stomping your feet. The strong vibrations of the ground should scare it away. If the snake bit you anyway, try to remember exactly what it looked like. Better yet, take a picture of it. To neutralize the venom, you need to take an antidote to the specific venom of that species of snake. You're on your way to Northeast Asia. As you're going through the dense jungle, you see a clearing. Several wild boars are peacefully grazing there. One of them is a female with several children. It'll do anything to protect them, so it's especially aggressive now. Oops, it spotted you. Get ready to defend yourself. If the wild boar is making high-pitched, piercing cries, it's going to strike you. The first thing you need to do is to stay calm and stand still. You have a good chance that the boar will go on its way, but you see it starting to run. And now you have several options. A, you can run away. B, you can face the blow. And C, climb the nearest tree. The first option is wrong. Wild boars can run almost as fast as Usain Bolt, and when it catches up to you, its sharp tusks won't leave you a chance. Option B, stay where you are. Wrong. A wild boar can weigh as much as a motorcycle and be almost as long as an adult. A hit at 25 miles per hour will just knock you down. So the correct option is to climb the nearest tree. If there's no trees, then climb a car or a tall rock. You have to be in a higher position than the boar. When it realizes it can't reach you, it'll leave you alone. The most important thing is to stay away from wild boars. Never try to feed them or provoke them. Well, it's that time of year again, spring cleaning. Making your way outside, you grab the duster and broom to get rid of all those cobwebs on your windows. They don't stand a chance this time. Removing one cobweb after the other, you suddenly notice some weird-shaped mud stuck under the eaves and porch. What's this? It suddenly dawns on you. These have to be mud dauber wasp nests. You're probably thinking there's a swarm of them around with so many nests being side by side. Luckily, mud dauber wasps are solitary insects. Whew! All those little mud huts are filled with paralyzed spiders. Sometimes, even up to 500 spiders can be trapped in these lockers, just waiting for the wasp young to hatch. If the nest has holes, it may indicate the nest is inactive or old, as mud dauber wasps create holes when they leave the nest. If you're not going to remove them, it's best to wait till nighttime when they're not as active. While they're pretty placid, if they feel threatened, they won't hesitate to stay. Looking like someone got halfway through building one insect and forgot what part came next, the mole cricket is one insect that really looks out of this world. With claws like a mole, a body of a cricket, and the head of a shrimp, this critter is like the platypus of the insect world. They're not venomous and will only bite if you trap them inside your hand. And if you really annoy it, it's got something else up its sleeve. The wings. They can spit a foul-smelling brown liquid from their body, just like a skunk. So just let them leave your home and there will be nothing to clean up. 
Rock pools are teeming with all sorts of plant and animal life. Sea creatures such as starfish, seagrass, hermit crabs, tiny fish, and all types of octopuses. If you come across this tiny blue-ringed octopus, it's best to leave it alone. It's flashing neon blue at you for a reason. This miniature octopus has a venomous bite that's a thousand times stronger than cyanide, with no antidote available. Don't poke it with a stick or try to pick one up. It's not worth the trip to the hospital or the morgue. Snakes on land are scary, but sea snakes are on an entirely different level. Found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans, there are about 50 different species of sea snakes, and they're beautiful as much as they're dangerous. Luckily, they don't seem to worry about us too much. The Dubois sea snake is arguably the most venomous snake in the ocean, with the big sea snake not far behind. Their venom makes a cobra's bite seem like a walk in the park. The venom of both these snakes is extremely dangerous. Good thing for us that their venom can take hours to cause any symptoms in humans. If they can bite through your wetsuit, that is. Now, if this fly lands on your arm outside, you might just scream a little. Hey, I wouldn't blame you. The scorpion fly, as its name suggests, has a curved tail that looks just like a scorpion stinger. But you can breathe a sigh of relief. This is only used for mating. It also has a long beak-like head that's used to feed after stealing insects from spiders' webs. To find the perfect partner, they love to give the equivalent of a box of chocolates and flowers. Except theirs is saliva. Hmm, how romantic. If you happen to be in Africa, you might just miss this large bird if you're not paying attention. The shoebill will just casually stand still as you walk right on by. Growing up to 5 feet tall with an 8-foot wingspan, the shoebill sounds like an apex predator though it's anything but. Known as one of the most slow-moving birds, almost statue-like, the shoebill just eats fish near the surface of the water, without a care in the world. This bird isn't afraid of humans at all. While they won't naturally come over to talk about the weather, they'll allow us to get close enough for some photos. Now, if you hear a small squeaking sound while you're in the garden, it could be a mouse, a squirrel, or... A rhinoceros beetle is letting you know that you are too close. They love to make a racket when bothered. With a giant scary horn on top of their head, they might seem like they're able to defend themselves with it. But that's not possible at all. That's only to move leaves and sticks out of their way, and to stop other males from coming into the female beetle's area. Not only have they got a horn on their head, but they've also got Herculean strength able to lift 850 times their own weight. It's like you or me lifting 65 tons or 11 elephants. Hey, let's try it. Nah. Found mainly in China, the small tufted deer looks adorable with its tuft of hair. That is, until it turns around. Oh no, it's a vampire deer! Luckily, this animal doesn't want to taste your blood or wear a cape. Only males grow these during the mating season, rather than antlers, to fight over territories and female tufted deer. These fangs are more like elephant tusks than sharp teeth. Not only do they have fangs, but they're also known to bark like a dog and flee like a cat when they're scared. Red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky in the morning, sailor's warning. No one said anything about a red tide, though. The red tide is a toxic algal bloom that rises up from the seafloor after particularly bad storms. This algae looks a lot like spilled ketchup or rust in the water, but it's much worse for the life around it. Fish and marine life will try to escape once exposed to the toxic algae in their water. It's not particularly harmful to humans who are exposed to it. But if you eat seafood contaminated with its toxins, things can become a bit more serious. So, if the sea is red, just stay out of the water. Some spiders love to show off with bright colors to show they're dangerous. Not the Sydney funnel-web spider of Australia. This glossy black spider doesn't need theatrics to prove it's tough. 
These bad-tempered crawlers cause serious alarm when they decide to bite us. They can shut down our entire nervous system in as little as 30 minutes. Making their web in any shelter, like old logs, shoes, or even garden gnomes, the funnel web spiders like to live close to our surroundings for easy food. When they get tired of an area, they just leave their web behind and wander off to find somewhere new. <laughs> Perfect. Some say honey badgers don't care, and I think they might be right. When you're brave enough to take food away from a jaguar, lion, or hyena, hey, what do you got to fear? These tough relatives of the weasel aren't just ferocious, they're super smart. Known to even use tools to escape from enclosures. Objects like rakes, stones, and mud just become things to climb for freedom. Aside from their physical similarities to the skunk, the honey badger also boasts a dangerous gland in its tail, containing a powerful stink machine. So they're tough, stinky, have extremely stretchy and strong skin, and to top it all off, they've got a strong immunity to scorpions and snakes. The best thing to do if you walk into a honey badger is to leave it alone. What chance do we have? Ever heard of the fungus strawberries and cream? No? What about its other name, the bleeding tooth fungus? This fungus isn't toxic, but tastes so bitter that you might think twice about trying some. When young and growing, this white mushroom appears to have red jelly coming out of its pores. This sticky liquid is sap that's pushed up from taking on too much water. The adult mushroom is just a boring beige compared to this. Underneath the mushroom cap, where its spores are produced, it has a tooth-like structure, just to make it even weirder. Tasmanian devils have a reputation for being bad-tempered when threatened by a predator, fighting other males, or getting a place at the table for dinner. They're dubbed devils because of the teeth-bearing, lunging, and one of the scariest shrieks you'll ever hear in the middle of the night. They'll also eat pretty much anything they can get a hold of, too. They don't habitually go for people, although they will defend themselves if they're cornered. With such a powerful bite, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end. Good thing the Tassie Devils would much rather escape as well. Burglaries are on the rise in your neighborhood, and you have concerns about whether your house might be vulnerable. You have no surveillance system, so tonight, you're placing some foil over the front door handle before you go to bed. This will help identify if someone sneakily tries to enter while you sleep. You wake up the next morning, and it appears the foil is slightly ripped. Someone has been here, and they're sure to return. Another option is to put a mug on the doorknob. When the knob turns, the mug will fall causing a noise to wake you up and hopefully deter the intruder. Your main concern is that a tradesman stopped by recently. He said that he was working next door and asked to use your toilet. You refused and felt bad at the time for being rude, but it was a very smart move. About 60% of burglaries in the USA are made by someone you know or have met before. That tradesman, while going to the bathroom, could have adjusted something in your house to make their return entry a little easier. They may have wanted to take a closer look at what security system is installed, check the structural integrity of your home, and found out what valuable loot you might have. Finally, today you're going on vacation. You need to prepare your house and make it as safe as possible. A full post box is the first thing a robber will look for in a target. Your neighbor will need to take your mail while you're away. A well-manicured property is a clear sign that you are always there. You've always kept your lawn mown and hedges trimmed, so you will need to arrange for someone to do this while you're away. If it was winter, any untouched snow around your house would also make it a target. Having a neighbor make pretend footprints that show recent activity will also provide a deterrent. There are many types of hedges that act as a great first defense. Luckily, you have sharp-leaved shrubs along your fences. If someone jumps into your property, 
and lands on a sharp or spiky bush, they will immediately cry out in discomfort. This will alert your neighbors of an intruder. And the foliage will also catch fragments of clothing that could be used as evidence later. In preparation for your trip the week before, you opened and closed your curtains at random times throughout the day. You made sure there were no clear patterns, so it won't matter if they're left open while you're away, just in case someone was scouting your property. Burglars spend several days walking or driving through neighborhoods, identifying the behaviors of each house. One thing they don't really like is a neighborhood watch. Criminals do their research before they start scouting and will avoid these areas. Something for you to organize when you get back. Now, move all your expensive electronics away from the windows so there's nothing of value in clear view. Put them inside a cupboard or a concealed room. Don't worry about TVs. They're too large and take effort to move. The criminals are more interested in the smaller devices, like an iPad and gaming devices. Put your small expensive items, like jewelry, in boxes and hide them away in a secret location. Surprisingly, a kid's room is a good spot. Burglars have admitted to never going into them, as there's nothing of value in toys. Take photos of all the serial numbers on your electronic devices and create an inventory for insurance purposes. 95% of break-ins are done by force, so it's time to reinforce your windows and doors. You can make it even more difficult for the crooks. Remove all stools, chairs, and ladders in the backyard and put them into your garage. Otherwise, they will help provide easier access points to higher entrances, like the air conditioner box. This is one of their favorites. Without a way to reinforce it, it's easy to tear off and creates an entrance. Don't make it easier for them with a step up. Burglars can break down a weak door within one minute. Install a metal frame instead of wood for more support. The hinges and lock should have adequate strength to withstand being kicked long enough until they give up. With the lock as the remaining weak spot, this can easily be picked by an experienced thief. A simple protection lock that holds it in place will make sure it won't budge. The hinges on your garage door swing outwards, which makes it vulnerable and can be accessed by taking the pins out of the hinges. Replace them with tamper-proof pins so they can't be removed. And lastly, the garage overhead door is one of the first places a burglar looks to access. They don't have a lock that fully secures them. Attach a padlock on the latch connecting it to the track, holding it in place. Your garage door doesn't have this option, so drill a hole in the track just above one of the rollers and attach a padlock. Robbers are scared of dogs, the territorial and loyal guardians of the house. A survey found that most houses burgled didn't have dogs because thieves don't want to draw attention during a heist. Unfortunately, you don't own one, but just placing a dog bowl outside the front door will discourage them. The burglars have adapted their craft with technology. Four out of five criminals use social media, like Facebook, Twitter, and Google Maps to find their targets. Even sharing a photo with a house key in it is enough for a burglar to create their own key by zooming in and taking the exact measurements. Make sure your wireless network is secure and use a new, much stronger password while away. You're not only vulnerable to physical objects being stolen. Valuable data like passwords and access codes can be taken through your network. And there's also the threat of infecting devices through malicious malware. You can also remove the vision of your house completely from Google Maps. Type in your home address Find the street view of your residence, press the Options button, and select Report a Problem. You'll be taken to a screen with an image of your home, with the option to move a red square to cover your property. Request it to be blurred under the option My Home, and enter your exact address. 
It will only take a couple of days to be processed. Don't leave the radio on while away. It won't help. Through the burglar's method of scouting houses, they take note of radio and TV sounds. When they return, they check if they're still on, which just makes it easier to confirm that no one's home. An alternative option to show active presence at home is by making your own audio, something that plays ambient noises randomly throughout the day, with footsteps, conversations, and a dog barking. Leaving your lights on is also not a good idea. Someone spying will notice your house easier, especially at night, and you'll be further robbed on your electricity bill. You're just about ready to leave on your vacation and need to take the trash out. If you have some large boxes, break them down so they can fit inside the bin. Hide any clues about what valuables you recently received. Last check, all the doors are locked and no windows are left open. Now you can finally enjoy your trip. But as you enjoy yourself in your picturesque location, leave any snaps on your phone while you're over there and post them online only when you return. If you do share your photos while you're away, it will have made all your preparations pointless. Every criminal in the area will know you're not home. But with 2.5 million houses burgled annually in the USA, a house without a modern security system is 300% more likely to be broken into. When you get back from your break, it will be a great idea to install one. Earthquake lights are some of the most mysterious natural phenomena. They can show up before, during, or after an earthquake. They're usually white or blue and last for a short time, but sometimes they can last up to 10 minutes. It's hard to study them because they can happen at different distances from an earthquake center. We know that they only happen during powerful earthquakes that have a Richter scale rating of 5 or higher. Scientists believe they may be caused by the release of ionized oxygen that occurs when certain rocks break apart. This next weird phenomenon is not spontaneous, but it doesn't make it any less impressive. You'll need to head over to La Macarena, Colombia to see it. It's called the Liquid Rainbow or the River of Five Colors. Here you can see the river change colors from red, yellow, green, and purple depending on the light and water conditions. This amazing sight is caused by a very talented aquatic plant. It attaches itself to the rocks in the river and gives the water a reddish color. The water is also very clear with very few particles floating in it, making the red pigments show even clearer. Should you ever reach this amazing destination, you'll also meet diverse fauna hanging around the lake. Red macaws can be seen at this location as well as howler monkeys. Every fall and spring, a magnificent natural phenomenon takes place in the Wadden Sea region in Northern Europe. Approximately 1.5 million starlings flock at the same spot to rest in the tall grass for the night. However, before the night settles in, the starlings may be surrounded by hungry birds of prey. This creates a mesmerizing dance as the starlings form intricate patterns to escape from the birds of prey. This spectacle is referred to as the black sun and involves thousands of millions of birds flying in formation. The reason for their synchronized flight is that it makes it more challenging for predators to single out and capture some of the starlings. Volcanic sounds, also called volcanic acoustics, can happen before an eruption. They come from magma getting pressurized in cracks and pipes, bubbling explosions, and hot water systems near the surface of the volcano. As the magma rises, gas builds up and cracks the surface open. The gas-rich magma creates a sound like a pipe organ, which is known as a volcanic tremor. The sound changes over time, resembling a natural concert. A volcanic tremor is a sign that an eruption is coming. So it's best to seek shelter if you hear anything unusual near a volcanic site. One of the most surreal phenomena to experience on Earth is near sand dunes. Should you ever be at the top of a sand dune, 
you may be lucky enough to hear one of the strangest things, singing sand. The truth is scientists have yet to fully understand why this phenomenon occurs. One theory claims that the sand might produce this sound while sliding down the dunes because of the friction between its grains. But how can you recognize whether what you hear is singing sand? Well, it's similar to an airplane flying in the distance. One of the few places on Earth where sand makes such a loud noise that it can actually be heard by tourists is in the Namib Desert in Africa, or in the barking sands of Hawaii. To see a rare golden waterfall, you'll have to drive to Yosemite National Park, more precisely, to the Horsetail Falls. You will need to plan your trip ahead of time to make sure you get there either in the winter or early spring. It's the only period of the year when this beautiful sight can be spotted. Let's be clear, it's not real gold falling down the mountain. Actually, it's an optical illusion. When at dusk, the sunlight hits the waterfall in such a unique way that it makes it look like a river of lava or gold. In a California national park called Death Valley, there are some rocks that seem to move on their own and leave trails behind. Scientists thought the roadrunner bird could be responsible for these movements, but this creature is too small to drag rocks around. They also thought it could be the wind, but the rocks are also too heavy to be blown away. Scientists have been studying the rocks for years. But until 2014, they hadn't actually seen the rocks move. They'd just seen them in different positions at different times. With the help of time-lapse photography, they discovered that the movement was caused by a combination of rainfall, rapid temperature changes, and a bit of wind. When it rains, the water sometimes freezes and the rocks get stuck in the ice. As the temperature rises, the ice starts to melt and moves slowly, dragging the rocks with it. The traces left behind solidify under the heat of the sun. The ice sheets that move the rocks is very thin and evaporates quickly which is why it was difficult for scientists to understand this phenomenon. Have you ever heard of a dirty thunderstorm? Buckle up, because I'm about to take you on a wild ride through the world of volcanic lightning. No, it's not a new dancing technique, although that would be pretty impressive. It's just a funky way of saying lightning and thunder during a volcanic eruption. When a regular thunderstorm happens, positive and negative particles collide and create a big spark of lightning. And the rumble you hear? That's just thunder. But when a volcano starts to holler, some ash particles get electrified and start colliding with each other. This causes electrical discharges, making it look like there's lightning coming straight from the volcano. And with all the ash, smoke, and gas flying around, it looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. That's why it's sometimes called a dirty thunderstorm too. Whoa, did you just see that giant ray of light shooting up into the sky? They're called light pillars. And don't worry, they're not a magic trick, just a bunch of ice crystals playing tricks on us. You see, when it's cold outside, these ice crystals floating near the ground reflect light from unshielded lights and create these columns of light that look like they're coming from outer space. But really, it's just a bunch of little crystals showing off their reflective skills. And if you think those natural light pillars are cool, wait till you see the artificial ones. They can be even taller because the light from streetlights is not the same. Ice crystals can reflect the light even if they're a little tilted. Just imagine, all that light is coming from streetlights just a few feet away. So next time you see a light pillar, don't run for cover, just enjoy the show. If you come across these quirky, bubble-like shapes in the sky, consider yourself lucky. These little gems are called mammatus clouds, and they're not your everyday run-of-the-mill clouds. Most clouds are formed when air rises, making them look like big cotton balls. But mammatus clouds are formed when air sinks, making them look like they're upside down. The air above and below such clouds creates a little turbulence, and before you know it, cloud particles form perfectly round orbs. Just don't stand there gawking at them for too long. They often signal that a thunderstorm is on its way. What do we have here? 
It looks like the sun is wearing a colorful party hat made of rainbows on top of the Ore Mountains in Germany. This phenomenon is called a sun halo, by the way. These snow-covered trees look like they're joining in on the fun too. It's all thanks to those ice crystals in high clouds. They love to bend and reflect light, making it look like the sun is having a halo lava lamp dance party. And yes, it might mean that bad weather is just around the corner, but don't let it spoil your fun. You can still hang around and take some great pictures. It happens every 43.8 seconds. I'm talking about car theft in the USA. Yep, every minute someone loses their precious vehicle to crooks. If you want to learn more about these heartbreaking stats, here you go. Over 800,000 car thefts were reported in the US in 2020 alone, and Ford pickups win the award for the crook's choice, since it was the one most frequently stolen. Also, New Year's Day had the most thefts. Seems like we all need to keep an eye out for our cars. First things first, it's very unlikely that someone may steal your car while you're on the move. But once you park it, it gets way easier. So you need to park responsibly. Yeah, sometimes you might need to walk a bit more, but it's worth it if it means leaving your car in a well-lit place. Improperly parked cars are often taken away by tow trucks. Turns out, not all of them are real. So should you ever see one near your car, check whether it's real or fake. A real tow truck should at least have some branding on it, and its crew should be wearing a uniform. Remember I told you it's not that easy to steal your car while you're on the move? Sorry, but that's only partially true. Carjackers don't really care about the fact that you're sitting in your car. The trick here is simple. Even if you're inside your vehicle, always make sure to lock your doors. Carjackers often have shady schemes of how to lure car owners out of their vehicles. They may even set up a trap and sort of stage a car accident. So even if you see that your car has been bumped from behind, don't rush out of it instantly to check on it. Just wait a little bit to pull over. Make sure the place where you stop is safe and there are people around you. In case you get suspicious, it's better to call the police. If you're ready to shell out some money to protect your car, here's some info. You can install a remote car starter. It's not just a great thing for those who live in colder climates and who need to start their car beforehand. Its main advantage is that you can't drive away with a car started like this, since this mode doesn't allow you to shift gears. Any car has a vehicle identification number, or simply VIN. This one may seem pointless, but here's a trick. When thieves sell a stolen car, they do VIN switching. It's when they want to disguise a stolen vehicle and use another VIN from a similar car. But if you etch your VIN on each window of your vehicle, crooks will instantly see that you're interested in protecting your car. Plus, such a vehicle will seem spoiled for them. After all, they'd have to do the VIN switching, plus they'd have to come up with a plan on how to fix the windows as they have the VIN etched on them. They'll probably need to change the windows altogether, and that's pricey. So reselling such a car would appear too time-consuming for crooks, and they aren't willing to put in that much effort. Come on, these guys don't even work. They're way too lazy to deal with those windows. By the way, some specialists can do this etching for you, so you don't have to deal with it yourself. By the way, if you want to buy a used car, a VIN can help you a lot. Some cars are sort of cloned, which means their VIN isn't real, but was simply added to the plate manually. So you have to check all the documentation before buying a used car. Pay special attention to the DVLA V5 documents and make sure that the VIN there coincides with the VIN on the vehicle. Here's another protection gadget. It's called a smart car alarm, and its sound is even nastier than the sound of an alarm clock. It can do two things. First, it makes a super loud sound that can both scare away intruders and attract witnesses. Second, it can send you an alert in case you somehow don't hear the deafening sound it makes. There's another secret mechanism that can protect your car. You can install an emergency stop button that you can wire to the ignition, battery, fuel line, you name it. When you get out of the car, you simply need to flip the switch. 
Even if crooks steal your keys somehow, it won't help them. They need to find the switch to start the car first, and it's up to you where to hide that switch. We all know that the more security you have in your car, the better. Crooks don't like to mess with technologies, and the statistics prove it. Tesla, along with other high-tech cars, were the least stolen ones over the last few years. However, modern doesn't mean safe and crook-proof. Many cool vehicles have engine management diagnostic ports. Sounds super convenient, but there's a downside. These ports can help unlock and even start the vehicle. So if your car has such a feature, consider getting a lockable cover. Always check whether you've closed the windows before leaving your car. Even the smallest gap is enough for a crook to open the door and steal the car. Yeah, don't tell me it's obvious. I somehow see cars with open windows every single day. If a crook really wants to, they can simply smash a window with a heavy object or even a rock. See what I'm driving at? Try not to make crooks want to open your car. That means there shouldn't be any valuables visible. So please, no laptops or purses on the front seat. Hide them in the trunk or take them with you. There are many options. Just don't show thieves that there's something they can steal from your car. Keeping a spare key in the glove box isn't the best idea either. Crooks know where to look for it. It's really simple. They've opened the car, which isn't that complicated, and they just open up the glove box and they're free to drive. Glove box and they're free to drive. So let's say you still keep your valuables in the car and a spare key in the glove box because, you know, you like it that way. Well, consider installing a steering wheel lock. It's probably not that functional, but experts believe it's a working visual deterrent. Remember how thieves are sort of lazy and don't want to mess with various gadgets? Specialists claim that crooks are more likely to pass by a car that has a steering wheel lock on it. So even if a crook still wants to drive your car away, they won't be able to. Plus, it's not that easy to remove it. Now for the most obvious tip. It's CCTV. There's a variety of such cameras today. They have night vision modes, people detection functions, and really high resolution. Literally anything you might need. A real camera can help you watch your car 24-7. But in case you don't feel like spending money on that, you can install a dummy and hope that the thieves won't figure it out. Okay, let's imagine the worst. Someone ignored all of these simple tips and got their car stolen. What should they do? First, they need to provide all the information to the police. So make sure you know the color. I know, it's easy. But please don't use complicated wording while describing the car color. Like, it's not moss, but rather dark green. You also need to know the year, make, and model. Make sure you remember all these. The police will also need to know your license plate number and VIN. If you don't remember the VIN by heart, write a note on your phone just in case. Ah, a purple sunset. You must have seen one of those at least once in your life. Normally, it's nothing ominous and has to do with the way light travels. The light that the sun produces is white. When it goes through a prism, you see light waves of different colors, from red and orange to blue, green, and indigo. Light normally travels in a straight line if there's no obstacle in its way. The shorter light waves, including blues and purples, are scattered easier when they meet with those obstacles, like molecules and aerosols in the atmosphere. Because the sun is low on the horizon at sunset and sunrise, its light has to pass through more molecules that scatter the violet and blue light. The colors that your eyes pick up, then, are yellow, orange, and red. But with the right conditions, you can see the gorgeous purple sky. Sometimes purple sky appears for much scarier reasons. It can be caused by hurricanes, wildfires, or dust storms. The concentration of vapor in the air increases, and the light scatters more than usual. Dust, a setting sun, and low cloud cover all contribute to this natural show, too. The sky turns orange and red at dusk if there's still enough light. Then it gives off pink hues, which mix up with a dark blue sky above. Now, do you remember what happens when you mix pink and blue? You get the color purple. Not every hurricane makes the sky turn purple, and trying to predict if it's going to happen is like trying to forecast a rainbow. 
Still, people reported several major hurricanes made the skies turn purple. Now, green skies might look just as spectacular as purple ones, but they actually also scream danger. They're usually there to tell you a thunderstorm, hailstorm, or a tornado is somewhere nearby. The unique color is a result of yellow sun rays getting mixed with the blue light coming from storm clouds. So you're enjoying a nice day by the ocean with a fresh breeze in your hair, when suddenly, you notice the water starts retreating from the beach at a huge speed. This is a sign for you to start running as fast and far away from the beach as you can. This most likely means that a tsunami is on the way. A quick reaction maximizes your chances of survival. Now, if you notice the sea level is rising, but it doesn't seem too extreme, it could be another sign of an approaching tsunami. It happens in 40% of cases, and the incoming water is the first tsunami wave. The next one, way larger and more dangerous, usually follows in about 10 minutes. Another thing about tsunamis is that they like to arrive with some loud sounds. People describe them as thunder, the sound of a locomotive, a helicopter, or just a loud boom. Do you see a channel of choppy water on the beach? It's in your best interest to stay away from the water. There might be a rip current under the surface that can be extremely dangerous. Sometimes waves hit the shore in a weird way, which forms these rip currents. You might see a strange break in the waves, or an area with a different color than the rest of the water. Random bits of seaweed going in all directions is another rip current warning sign. If you happen to find yourself caught in a rip current, try to stay afloat, but don't try to go against the current. You'll only waste precious energy. Scream for help and try to float your way along the beach. Once you break out of the current, swim diagonally to the shore. The next time you spot conically shaped clouds in the sky, remember it's a good time to start looking for some shelter. If it just stays like that, a severe storm is on the way. But if a cloud of that shape starts spinning around, it means it's about to transform into a tornado. If you have bees nearby, they can save you from big trouble one day. These hard-working little guys get more active than usual when they feel like a storm is on the way. They speed up to collect more nectar before it hits them, and once they're done with it, they'll always come back to the hive 10-15 to 15 minutes before heavy rain, even when there are no obvious signs of it coming. Their secret is super-sensitive hairs on the back that can pick up electrostatic buildups from storm clouds. For centuries, people have noticed that animals act weirdly a couple of days before big seismic events. Dogs can't start barking, cows halt their milk, and toads, rats, and snakes leave their homes. It looks like animals can feel smaller initial shock waves that humans don't even notice. Scientists have tried to find some legit explanation for it and run endless tests and experiments. But so far, they're still on their way to explaining this mystery. Can you smell ozone in the air? When a thunderstorm is on the way, it's the most distinct and pungent smell you can pick up. An electrical charge of lightning sets it free from higher altitudes. The other, more pleasant smell of rain is petrichor. Rainwater wakes up molecules on plants, trees, concrete, and asphalt. Their aroma spreads all over the place. You can even feel that smell in your own mouth. All those positive ions in the air that a lightning bolt sets free gets mixed with ozone and your saliva, and that's how you get that bitter, metallic taste. When lightning is about to strike, you might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your palms may begin to sweat, and then you can feel your hair stand on end. That's a clear call for action, and that action is to run for your life. Positive charges are going through your body, trying to reach toward the negatively charged part of the storm. Trust me, you don't want these charges to meet. If you see no shelter that you can reach fast, try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. Drop down your umbrella and stay away from wire fences, metal pipes, rails, and other metallic objects. And don't lie flat on the ground, it's likely wet, which means it's a great conductor of electricity. If you suddenly notice crevices in the asphalt next to your house, it could be a sinkhole warning sign. Inspect your house on the inside. Does that door begin to jam? 
Or maybe there's a gap where the walls meet the ceiling. Uneven kitchen cabinets and drawers, slanted floors, stairs that begin to slope, water leaking after every rain, and displaced moldings are all signs that a sinkhole is about to open. To find out if it's definitely a sinkhole and how dangerous it is, you got to consult with an engineering company. If you find a sinkhole that's already there, you got to stay away from the sinkhole area. Fence or rope it off to make it less dangerous for others. You'll need professional help to fix it. Some volcanoes scream when they're about to erupt. Small earthquakes, which often happen before, produce a hum. It's mostly non-audible to human ears, but sometimes it reaches a frequency that lets you hear it as a strange rumbling or hissing sound coming from the ground. This noise is known as a harmonic tremor. With some volcanoes, it's the sound of magma bubbles vibrating when they're going through crevices in the crust of the Earth. But it's not always like this. If scientists manage to understand what exactly causes these volcanic screams, they could create a limited early warning system for volcanic eruptions. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If its level is quickly falling, even if it's raining, this might be a sign of a nearing landslide. And if you hear a faint rumbling noise or unusual sounds, like boulders knocking together, it could mean debris is on its way to you. It's a sign to head to safety immediately, like right now. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the jumping cholla, or teddy bear cholla. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So, yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. 
Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous Gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The Gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still, there's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, but it's a separate species, Salpigid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. 
The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. You check into your hotel room, connect to Wi-Fi, jump on the bed, and post 15 photos of your new window view. When the initial surge of excitement is gone, you notice a suspicious blinking light on your big TV. Could it be that someone is watching you? Or have you just seen too many spy movies? Well, hidden cameras come in all shapes and sizes. Large ones are easy to spot, but the small ones can be really sneaky and inconspicuous. They can be hiding behind furniture, in decorations or vents, and anywhere else you'll have trouble noticing. There are even special cameras that can be hidden in everyday movable objects, like alarm clocks, picture frames, vases, and lamps. Check to see if these objects are facing at a strange angle or if they're positioned to get the best view of your room or bathroom. The easiest way to spot a hidden cam is to look for the lens reflection because all cameras come with lenses. Turn off the lights and slowly scan the room with a flashlight, laser pointer, or a special wireless spy cam detector. It comes with infrared scanning lights and one illuminating light. When you find a reflective red spot, you gotta turn on the flashlight to help check if there is a hidden camera. Definitely check the vents along with any other holes and gaps in the walls or ceiling. Some advanced detectors even show you what the camera is seeing, making it way easier to spot and disable. The detectors only work on cameras that are turned on and working normally, though. Your mobile phone can also help you find some hidden threats. Turn on Bluetooth and walk around. See if any unknown devices pop up on the screen. Another idea is to install a network scanner app that shows all devices that are connected to the Wi-Fi network you're using at the hotel. When it's done scanning, study the list for devices called something like IP camera or cam. Plus, you can put your phone on selfie mode, turn off the light and close the curtains and look around the room slowly while focusing on the screen. Keep an eye out for purple or white lights on the screen. You can play detective some more and call your friend or family member and start walking around your room. Secret cameras should emit a sort of radio frequency. It will most likely interfere with your phone call signal. If you start hearing any weird noises while you're on the phone in a certain area of your room, make sure to inspect it carefully. Check out the light switches, electrical outlets, lamps, and other objects you normally wouldn't pay attention to. If they look a bit crooked, have a hole, or seem misplaced, it could be a sign that someone tampered with them. Many spy devices need wires, and whoever installed them had to hide those wires, often behind the vinyl baseboard. That's why the place where the floor and the wall meet is another area you should check. Ridges, bumps, or discoloration could be a sign there's a microphone hiding there. The same goes for spots on ceilings and walls even if they're not larger than a coin. If you do find a hidden camera or something looking suspicious, don't shy away and let the hotel administration or your booking service know about it. Don't try to touch or move the device yourself. If the hotel denies everything, contact local law enforcement. After you've scanned the room for cameras, check out the mirrors. Someone could be watching you from the other side, First, see if the mirror is built into the wall or can be adjusted. If the mirror is semi-transparent, it will be built into the wall. You can do a simple test to check the mirror. Press your fingertip against the glass and push firmly enough to leave a fingerprint as you move your finger away. Study the fingerprint. If there is a small gap between the print and the mirror where the glass should be, then it's just a mirror. On a semi-transparent mirror, there will be no gap. Another way to check if your mirror is semi-transparent is simply to tap the glass. If someone is watching you from the other side, the mirror will make an empty sound. A double mirror needs a brighter light on the other side than on yours. 
Get close to it and cup your hands around your eyes. Do you see some light behind the mirror? If so, you might have an unwanted audience. Before you leave your room or go to bed, make sure every door is securely locked. By every door, I mean not only the entrance to the room, but also the door leading to the terrace, if you have one. You can bring a portable door lock with you for extra security if you're staying in. You could also start a little DIY project and wrap a belt or a bag strap around the arm that pushes the door shut. Buckle it up and wrap it around several times for an extra layer of protection. Another idea for when you're about to nap or go to sleep is to build a pyramid of stuff by the door. Glasses and mugs will do perfectly. If someone tries to get inside while you're sleeping, there'll be some serious noise. Intruders prefer to keep it low-key, so they're highly likely to give up on robbing you straight away. If you travel with some valuables and don't feel comfortable leaving them around the room, you could put them in the safe inside your room. But because those safes use passcodes instead of physical locks, someone from the hotel has to know the master code to unlock it, just in case. So, you can bring your own safe with you instead. You can find the ones looking like books on Amazon, for example. They're made of strong metal and textured paper. They come with a combination lock and have enough room to fit your passports, cash, and jewelry. In case you have to leave your laptop in the room and want to make sure no one plugs in a USB drive to steal your data, here's what you can do. Leave a bottle of water or some other item next to the USB port. Measure the distance. Let's say it's one thumb length away. For someone to plug in their device in the laptop, they need to move the bottle. You can take it one step further and drop a pen parallel to the laptop under a certain angle. You can measure the angle with your smartwatch or phone using the Compass app. Again, if someone moves it, you'll know. Even something as simple as a please do not disturb sign can help you figure out if someone entered your room while you were away. Make it look like you left in a rush and the sign accidentally stuck between the door and the door frame. If you come back and the sign is hanging freely, then someone must have ignored it and tried to disturb you. In that case, you can contact reception and ask to send someone to enter the room with you to keep you safe. If you care about the cleanliness of your room as much as you do about your belongings and your personal safety, this one's for you. Hotel housekeeping workers normally have up to 20 rooms to take care of on an 8-hour shift. It means they'll have no more than 30 minutes for your room. It gives them enough time to make the bed, clean the floors in the room and the bathroom, empty the trash bins, and dust all surfaces. But they rarely have the time to take care of smaller objects like light switches, door and drawer handles, and remotes. And yes, these are exactly the objects you'll be in contact with the most. They can actually have more germs than the toilet. So if you want to be sure those germs won't land on your hands, bring enough antibacterial wipes to clean all those things before you touch them. On some nights, when the sky over a powerful thunderstorm is clear, you might see elves, gnomes, trolls, or blue jets. Blue jets sound kind of random here, right? But we're not actually talking about fairy tales. These are all just different types of lightning flashes that are mostly visible very high above raging thunderstorm clouds. Let's take red sprites. Those are flashes of light that appear above thunderstorms that come in clusters. They are rare because they're only caused by a specific type of lightning called positive cloud-to-ground strikes. So a positive charge is transferred from a thundercloud to the ground during a lightning strike. These types of lightning make up only 10% of all lightning strikes. For more than half a century, many believed these flashes were just urban legends. People did see them from time to time, but the flashes were so brief that even if you had been lucky enough to catch them, you wouldn't have had time to call someone to witness this phenomenon with you. Even when respectable scientists or pilots would talk about them, the scientific community would mostly ignore them. In 1989, something strange happened. 
the researchers from the University of Minnesota actually managed to catch sprites on film. And that's how it started. People across the world began sharing videos and photos of red sprites. Red sprites can start as 328-foot balls made of ionized air. These balls shoot down from heights of about 50 miles at 10% of the speed of light. And researchers have been studying not only the lightning that plunges down from ranging clouds, but these colorful flashes that go towards space too. So, electricity stretches up to the electrically charged ionosphere, but at the same time, it crushes down towards the ground. Red sprites come in different shapes, like these big, cool jellyfish sprites that sometimes have areas that measure up to 30 square miles. You may see carrot sprites or column sprites. They're similar, it's just that carrots also have long tendrils. The lower parts of tendrils are often blue, while the higher ones are red. On August 22nd, 2022, we were able to take some stunning photos of bread right streaks in the sky above the Atacama Desert in Chile. They were surrounded by another bigger glow of greenish color. It's something we call air glow, and you can only see it this well when there's no light pollution. It's basically when we use too much artificial light, and among other things, it doesn't allow us to observe stars and other objects we might otherwise see in the sky. And this air glow happens because of atoms of nitrogen and oxygen in our atmosphere. Sunlight knocks away their electrons during daytime. Then, they slowly recombine with their electrons, which is a process that causes them to glow. How can you see a red sprite? First, you need to find a large thunderstorm. They're more common during summer and spring, for example, in June. Of course, sprites can appear at any time if there are powerful enough storms with lightning at ground level. The skies need to be clear and very dark, ideally without bright moonlight. And the storm should be around 100 to 200 miles away. That way, clouds won't block the sky and you'll have better visibility. In the perfect scenario, the storm will be moving along a distant horizon, so you'll be able to see everything above the cloud tops. You can track a storm with weather radar. Your eyes need some time to adapt to the darkness around you. Give them some time, about 20 to 30 minutes. Keep your eyes above the clouds and try not to look at the clouds directly. Ignore lightning flashes. A sprite will pop maybe once for every 200 lightning strikes. Don't expect to really capture it on camera, it's not easy. But the view itself will likely be worth the wait. This and similar flashy events are something we call TLEs, which stands for Transient Luminous Events. Blue jets are also worth mentioning. These are dim blue lights that stream up like a very fast puff of smoke above powerful hailstorms. They're also very rare, and in most cases, you'll only be able to see them from an airplane. And now we get to those fairy tale creatures. Elves, when we talk about lightning flashes, are brief disks of dim light you can see about 60 miles high in the atmosphere. It's just an abbreviation. Their full name is Emissions of Light and Very Low Frequency Perturbations Due to Electromagnetic Pulse Sources. Yeah, I suggest we stick to elves. Moving to trolls, those are red spots that pop close to cloud tops after the flash of a very powerful red sprite. Gnomes are the smallest and fastest flashes. We're talking about tiny white spikes of light that flash from the top of a big anvil of thunderclouds. The anvil is that elongated cloud you see at the top of a raging storm. It spreads downwind together with upper level winds and gnomes last for only a microsecond. And check this out. Ball lightning is in the shape of fiery orbs that can be as big as a golf ball or can grow up to a very large beach ball. They can be yellow, red, white, orange, green, or purple, and they can stay alive for a couple of seconds, even minutes sometimes. For the centuries, many people have been talking about how they saw ball lightning sometimes even floating into their homes. 
But such events are really unpredictable and happen very rarely. Scientists have managed to recreate ball lightning in the lab, or at least something very similar to it. They have realized that ball lightning probably shows up after a lightning bolt strikes the ground. Mineral grains in the soil then vaporize. Here's something spectacular, volcanic lightning. This one is born in the plumes of a wild volcanic eruption. Like the rest of thunderstorms, volcanic lightning forms when static electricity builds up in Earth's atmosphere. And then it gets released in the shape of a lightning bolt. Scientists don't understand the whole mechanism here, but they think it's related to charging. For example, ice charging is what causes thunderstorms to form. It plays a part in producing lightning during volcanic eruptions too. This happens when the air heated in an eruption rises into the sky and meets cold air. The water from the eruption turns into ice particles, and when these particles bump into each other, some electrons get knocked off. The ice particles that now have more positive charges move higher into the sky and gather together. Or it may be frictional charging, another thing that leads to volcanic lightning. The same as ice charging happens when tiny particles of ice collide. Here we have ash and pieces of rock colliding and creating charged ions. There's dark lightning too. Over 10 years ago, researchers discovered that thunderstorms could generate brief but very strong bursts of gamma rays, which is the form of light with the highest energy. They are so bright that they can blind sensors on satellites, even when they're hundreds of miles away. They can also create antimatter. Antimatter is a type of matter made of particles with opposite charges compared to the particles in normal matter. Imagine having two boxes full of blocks. Some blocks are red and some are blue. When these pairs touch each other, they disappear or annihilate and turn into energy. That's what happens when particles of matter and antimatter meet. And these flashes could be the result of dark lightning because it gives off light that's not really visible. Regular lightning involves slow electrons. In dark lightning, electrons are high energy. They crash into air molecules and, by doing that, produce gamma rays. Oops, another burglary in the U.S. has just occurred. Wait another 22.6 seconds and there will be another one. Hey, no need to worry about your property. Forewarned, forearmed. Let's explore a few tips on how to protect your house. A mere sticker can contribute a lot to your house's safety. For instance, you can use a sticker that says you have a home security system, even if in reality you don't. It may not sound convincing enough, but still, burglars prefer not to mess with such houses. Just one more tip here. Make sure the sticker looks true to life, so a makeshift sign won't do. It's better to fork out some money and grab a real-looking sticker. Another smart trick is to leave a pair of really large shoes on the porch so that the burglars could clearly see them. It will make them think someone big and dangerous lives there, and they won't fancy meeting them. Right, now let's inspect your door. I hope you don't leave the keys under the doormat. The only things you can leave under the mat are the cookies or chips. This is a fun way to see if someone was visiting you while you were away. However, the trick doesn't give you a 100% guarantee. It might be a mailman, a delivery guy who got the wrong door, or even a random dog hanging around your porch. Yeah, cookies feel better in your stomach, not under the doormat. Okay, you're back home from work. It was a tough day and you're tired. You leave the keys in the keyhole and completely forget about it. Right, the main thing is that you've locked the door and the keys are inside. But who said there is no burglar in the bushes targeting your house? Technically, it might be impossible to insert a dupe and get in if there's a key in the keyhole. But these guys are well equipped and have a whole assortment of hooks to lure the key out. You know what happens next? They can seep into your house as silently as ninjas and grab all your valuables while you're peacefully sleeping. A lock that can only be closed from the inside and can't be opened from the outside seems like a good solution. When moving to a new place, even if you didn't buy it, but rent it, make sure to change the locks. Who knows how many copies of those keys there are? 
As for renting, you never know who lived there before you moved in. Also, if for some reason you accidentally left your keys in the front door for some time, the best thing to do is to change the lock. Yeah, probably nothing bad will happen, but still, it's better to play it safe. Plus, not only should you stop leaving the keys in the door, but you also shouldn't leave them on display. Maybe it's better to bring the keys to the living room instead of keeping them near the front door. Sometimes, burglars can use not only your door, but your window too. Mind your trash, especially if you throw away some pricey stuff packaging. Don't let the thieves know what you purchased and how much you paid for it. Also, your trash may contain some essential information about your personal data, credit card details, and so much more. Keep an eye on your mailbox. Make sure you have a lock on it. Thing is, burglars may be quite interested in your mail contents, so the secret is simple. Keep the mailbox locked and make sure you shred any personal data-related papers. Now let's inspect your front lawn. Hey, I can see something compromising. I'm talking about these large bushes. Yeah, I know, you don't have time to trim them. The larger they get, the more space there is for the burglars to hide. Plus, if someone sees untrimmed shrubs and trees in the front yard, they might think nobody's home. You see the point, right? Okay, let's say you ignored all the previous tips and burglars broke into your house. The most interesting thing for them is surely cash. If you don't have any cash at home, you can skip this tip. But if you have valuables, get creative. Cash can be stuffed into a plastic bag and hidden in a large container with some leftovers. Also, you can place that plastic bag into an old detergent bottle you keep in the storeroom or the kitchen. Burglars aren't likely to look for your stash there. A couple of don'ts here. Hiding cash or jewels in a prescription pills container isn't that smart. And yeah, a freezer isn't the best option either. Many burglars like to check it in the first place. Time to see if you keep your keys right. If you keep your car and house keys together, you might want to reconsider it. First off, imagine you lose them and burglars somehow know where you live. Not only will they grab what they want, but they'll also have a vehicle to transport all your hard-earned belongings. Keep an eye on your garage keys, especially if it's possible to sneak into your house through your garage. Even if it isn't, who said there are no valuables in the garage? However, there are no limits whatsoever for burglars. They can sneak into houses even through small windows. The reason why they prefer doors is that it's the safest way. While squeezing through the window can get scratches, and it's not that they don't want to spoil their looks. The thing is, if they leave their DNA, they can be traced. However, crooks are careful about not leaving their traces. For instance, a report from England claims only about 3% of burglars leave forensic evidence. To protect yourself at night, there are several options. Number one, insert a large paper clip or a bobby pin inside the keyhole. You can use a spare pair of keys if you have them. This way, you'll make it extremely hard, if not impossible, for the burglars to use the key dupes. Number two, barricading is an option. It can be a heavy chair, a bookshelf, you name it. I mean, why not if it makes you feel safe? If your door opens outwardly, a jammer could do a great job for you. A chair can be super handy. Secure it under the doorknob. It's not the most powerful security system, but at least it does its job. Binding the doorknobs or handles together can be an option too. A dummy security camera can protect you during the day and night. Again, burglars are not as fearless as they may seem. If you have a real CCTV, make sure the crooks don't deactivate it. So place it in some hard to get place. If you're ready to fork out some money for protection, then the motion sensor light is exactly what you need. Crooks like dim spots, and once they approach your place, they'll be frightened off by the bright light. This solution works as long as the burglars know you're home. In case they're sure you're away, it's way less efficient. TV and radio timers are another trick. With their help, you can imitate your home even if you're not. 
a perfect match for the motion sensor light. This trick can help outsmart some burglars, but again, it doesn't give a 100% guarantee. Some of them aren't afraid to break in, even if the TV's on. What about live alarm systems? This can be real or fake too. I'm talking about dogs. Remember the trick with the boots? You can do the same with a dog if you don't have one. Leave a large bowl on the porch, but make sure it all looks real. I mean, the bowl should not look untouched and brand new. Hey, do you know all your neighbors? If not, it's high time you baked some cookies and visited them to know them better. First, the crooks don't really like to operate in areas where few people know each other and care for each other. This way, their chances of being spotted and reported are extremely high. So, a sort of neighborhood watch is a perfect way to protect your house. And who knows? Find new friends. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these.